Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. I've got another fellow Aussie on the Storybox today, which is always great to have. Now, from a hardened criminal turned tournament combatant to a delusional patient of a psych- psychiatrist and a Harvard graduate who specializes in num- numerical analysis, Academy Award nominated screenwriter, director, producer, and actor Josh Lawson has brought captivating characters and compelling projects to life on screen for over a decade, solidifying himself as one to watch, not as not only an actor, but also a filmmaker. You are going to be starring, in, or you have starred in, the new film Mortal Kombat, which is directed by Simon McQuaid and produced by the awesome James Wan, who directed Aquaman. You've done so many other incredible movies. You've done uh, short uh, films. You've done on, on the TV, which I actually know you from. Um, House of Lies, you played mm-hmm. Doug Guggenheim, which is honestly insane. I can't believe I'm actually speaking with with Josh Lawson today. So, Josh, welcome so much to the Story of oh, podcast today. Great to be here. What an intro. Thank you, mate. Uh, so, no, thanks for having me on. You're welcome, man. Like, I could have gone on. Like, the the bio here is is just insanely long of all the great achievements you've actually accomplished in your in your life. And you're still really young too, so <laughs> you've oh, got so much. Mate, more look, um, I don't feel young. Let me tell you, I feel uh, I feel like uh, Father Time has kicked my lily white ass about, but uh, no, man, it's um, it's been you know I I got into it. Can you believe when I was like nine years old? So you say I'm you know over a decade. It's been it's been uh, like three decades since I've been in front of the camera. Three. Freaking decades. Um, I, I was grew up grew up in Brizzy, and uh, you know wanted to be an actor ever since I could you know look, I could talk, and convinced my brother and I then we convinced our mum to to let us have an agent at like nine years old. So we we found some you know agent who worked out of a house, and you know we'd walk in and see, go have a meeting, and the dogs would be barking. I mean it was such a rinky dink operation, but we started. That's how it all began. So I've been. Doing this for thirty years, unfortunately, but uh, so I'm in too deep. I can't do anything else. <laughs> you can't go back and change it now. No man. Uh, you. I don't have any other skills. That's the problem. Oh, you, you're multi. You multi talented man. You write. You direct. You act. You produce. You do all kinds of things. So I'm sure they'll find a place for you if you didn't go on the screen. You'd be behind the screen yeah. or doing yeah. some sort of thing. But I will get to that in a moment, but I, yes. I love asking all my guests at the very, very start a particular yeah, question, which is what does success look like to you? Yeah, so it's a great one and it's changed over the years. You know, if you were to ask the, the teenage version of me, I think it would be, you know, rich and famous movie star, right? And that that really doesn't interest me anymore, you know, because, you you, you know, it, it's all uh, it's all silly all that stuff you know fame particularly is so silly um so what does it mean to me i think if i could keep telling stories with people i love and respect and um if i could keep doing that forever Mm. uh and and laugh every day i'd call that a success yeah i really would um and that sounds like, I don't know if that sounds like, you know, new agey or, or you're like, oh, like I'm pandering and trying to say the right thing. I swear, you know, particularly with the last year we've had, I think a lot of people have taken a moment to think about what really matters, mm. you know. And I don't think many people are, are coming out of the last year going, yeah, after all the people who have died and after all being locked away. And so I think the important thing to me is money. Not that many people are saying that. It's it's just it's but you know I think we're kind of going relationships with good people and mm. and just being happy. So yeah, that's it, man. I, I love telling stories, whether it's behind the camera, in front of the camera. I love working with smart, challenging, uh, inspiring people, and I love to laugh. And so if I can do all three, I'm I'm sitting pretty. When was the moment for you? Was it more like this year or even last year that you sort of realized this exactly was success for you? Like fame, uh, wealth, all that sort of stuff didn't really matter to you? Has it been like this gradual thing over time, you reckon? Or was there a catalyst? Yeah. I think it was gradual. I think, um, but it wasn't just last year. I mean, it, it had started a little while ago. I, I would have thought, in my, you know, my early 30s, you know, started to 
started to realize I wasn't driven by money and stuff. You know, I started to learn that you could say no to projects, you know, not that people are coming to me, showering me with, with job offers, but, you know, there were certain job offers I, or, or even just auditions or whatever I'd get. And I'd be like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And yet my whole life I'd been sort of trained to do any job possible, work any moment you can, take the job. There's so few jobs you'll get, which is true, but, you know, just work, work, work. And then the older I got, I went, ah, no, nah, I'd, rather, I'd rather hang out with my dog than do a job I don't want to do. Mm. Or, you know, I, or I'd rather write, write, write at home for no money than be on set on a job I, I just don't want to do. And so that that sort of began the catalyst. And then there was a period of a time where I just wasn't working, long period of time after House of Lies, and I was hustling really hard and I just couldn't seem to stick the landing on anything. And um, I was scared. I was really scared thinking, holy shit, I'm not going to work. Mm. You know, this is what not working feels like. You know, for long, one year turned to two, turned to three, and I was really, I was really nervous. And then... And then weirdly in all that, I got the Oscar nomination with Darren Seal for, for you know, at the 11 o'clock. And, I, you know, you would think that that would be a game changer. I mean, as a kid growing up in Brisbane, oh, get into the Oscars. That was it. That was the pinnacle, the zenith of, of the industry. Mm. And then when you find yourself there, it's all a bit, it doesn't, it's all silly, you know, like you're competing, these Films are competing against each other. It's so weird. But the thing is, you know what's weird is you start to really want it. You know, firstly, you say to yourself, oh, I'm just getting nominated. Oh, that's and that's all that matters. But then you nominate and then you get close to the awards and then you start, it starts fucking with you. Yeah. And it's, you want it. You're like, holy shit, now I've got a one in five chance. But so, so now I really want it. And so it actually starts messing with your head. And then getting nominated isn't enough. Winning, you got to win. And then when you don't win and it all goes away, Mm. And the and the spell is lifted. You realize two things: one, it doesn't matter, and two, it doesn't change anything. Mm. So the Oscars is on Sunday. Well, what are you going to do Monday? <laughs> because let me tell you, two Mondays after that, no one's even going to be able to remember who won Best Picture. Mm. That's how, because we we live in such a quick turnaround now, and so this thing you've been dreaming of suddenly evaporates and you realize, oh, it's just about getting back to the job. It's There is no trophy you get. There's no finish line. You've just got to keep hustling. So it was a long-winded way to say I've had an amazing um, a career of ups and downs, probably more downs than ups, but it's just taught me that um, the journey, I know this is this is very much a greeting card, and I don't mean to, but the journey is more important than, than the destination, right? That if you just work, if the work is is what makes you happy, then then a job isn't going to bring you happiness because it's the actual work that you should be satisfied by. Mm. I love that answer, man. And I, I guess I have two questions coming out from that. But before I ask them, it's kind of like this this amazing thing how you've got to stay relevant especially in yeah. entertainment like if yeah. you're not famous tomorrow then something will go something else will go viral and everyone's attention will be on that or if you do something wrong yeah. then immediately the media like hypes on that so it's almost like yeah there's this quick society that we do live in it's like 10 second fame almost totally and then if you're not if you're not famous in, in for that amount of time it's like we, we get over you pretty quick so you mentioned absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. You you've how- got to capitalize so quickly. Yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and then with that in mind, the longer you go without work, the harder it is then to get work because yeah. you are getting colder and colder and colder and colder and colder. Mm. So all you want to do is you want to say, yeah, I'll be hot again if you give me a job. But they're going, yeah, but we can't give you a job because you're not hot. Yeah. Right? You're not hot right now. So yeah. you're in this spiral going down and down and down and down, going, shit, the longer I go without work, it's going to be hard for me to get a job. <laughs> so it, it becomes this vicious cycle. And, 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 and then the cycle works the other way, right? So if you're hot right now, you know, to quote Zoolander, you, you get the job, then you get another job, and then suddenly the same people keep getting the work. Mm. right because they're in this washing machine they're in a different washing machine they're going they're spiraling up and you're spiraling down and and the divide becomes so great mm. and there's just the gap between the two of you becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it just feels so insurmountable mm. but um 
But, you know, these days I think because there are so many avenues, you know, to there are so many channels, maybe too many, you know, go on to Netflix, how much content is there? It's dizzying. I mean, I if you don't go into Netflix with a plan, you're stuck in that. It's like it's the IKEA of streaming platforms, right? You get lost in there for for days. And so, so the, the good news is there are there are more avenues now than ever before to get work. But the bad news is there's more competition and the turnover is so quick. Mm. So you've got to be you got to be on it. I love your your humility, man, because like. For me, it's inspiring, like looking at your career, where you've come from to where you are right now, that's inspiring because when I started this about a year and a half ago, no, not a year and a half, it's about a year and three months or whatever, so not that long ago. And it's like it's interesting because when I, I thought that if I got, you know, Matthew McConaughey or Tony Robbins or the big people, then I thought maybe then other big people, other big famous names might actually give me a chance but it hasn't exactly right. worked out like that. It's this yeah. thing, but it, that didn't really, I'm like, this is going to satisfy me 100%. The moment I get them, mm-hmm. done, seal the deal. Right. It, it doesn't, it's like move on to the next thing. So I think what you're saying rings true for a lot of people. You got to find what actually really makes you happy. I love how you mentioned you'd much rather go spend time with your dog. Like yeah, that's, true. that's more meaningful. Like find the meaning that makes you happy and gives you fulfillment and contentment rather than going chasing this, this it's kind of like this um, kite, out, the wind's blown it away. Um, right. I'm use that analogy. Uh, if that makes it's sense. so true. And, and, you know, I'm glad I connected with you because in a way that story that we tell ourselves, or you've told yourself, if I get McConaughey, I get Robbins and it'll, it'll change things. You know, who told you that? Yeah. Nobody. We told ourselves that. Yeah. I told myself that if I got nominated for an Oscar, it would change. Nobody told me that. That was just something I told myself. And then when you realize it doesn't happen, I was like, oh, I made that up. Mm. <laughs> I made it up in my head. Nobody ever told me that was the rule of this industry, that you do a job and then you end up. No, it's just a story we told ourselves. Mm. And again, yeah, you can't lose if what you're doing is what you love. They can't take that away from you, you know. Uh, so then you, and, 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 and you can trick yourself as well in, and, and I, I want to make sure that, you know, you and anyone else listening, because I learned this lesson the hard way. Mm. You can say to yourself, oh, but I didn't get that job. So any, so all this stuff I've done is meaningless. But no, it's not meaningless. It's made you so much better. That interview with McConaughey and Robbins and stuff, that's actually made you better. Mm. So even though it didn't exactly lead on to that thing that you wanted it to, in, in ways that you probably will never be able to understand, it's made you a better, it's made you so much better at your job. So that ultimately when you do get that thing that feels like, oh, it happened overnight, it didn't. It, mm-hmm. It's all that stuff that led years of work that led, it just feels overnight, but it actually isn't. It's, it, 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 that seed was planted so long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a, so don't ever stop working or ever think that the work you're doing is meaningless. It's not. It's just planting seeds that will bloom way further down the track. So that's, that's, I just want to just keep that in mind. Keep going, man. Like, this is amazing. You're on a roll. <laughs> yeah. Fuck Tony Robbins, dude. I'm your motivational speaker. Yeah. Tony, eat your heart out. Mate, I should have gotten you way before I got Tony. That's <laughs> yes, it. I get my mate, Tony. Tony buys tickets to my seminars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is great. I love it, uh, Josh. Yeah. For you, man, when you when you you mentioned like after House of Lies, you thought you were going to get the next thing, but it was like a real struggle. Yeah. What kept you going in those in those days? Yeah, I mean, um, b- belief. You know, and and, and i got to say friends, friends, you know, a support group who who would, you know, when you're uh, over a beer and you sort of go, ah, that's a tough racket, you know, and they they go stick with it. And um, that helps. Those little little things help. People go go and don't give up. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think if I didn't have anyone saying anything, you do, you do feel, you just let go eventually. Um, But... uh, yeah, um, I, I wrote. I, I wrote. I I would write things that that would help um, keep me motivated and, and creative. Uh, do little classes. I did acting classes and stuff. That helped, you know, just to keep 
reminding me what I when I did this thing in the first place for, you know. And um, yeah, just one step at a time, really. But there was definitely a rock bottom, you know. I remember thinking, oh man, I'm 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 getting older. I'm you know mid thirties, suddenly late thirties, and I'm not working, and this isn't cute anymore. Um, and uh, but yeah, I I just you know you you just uh, take it one step at a time, really. And and I think if you looked at the mountain, you know, you looked at the peak of the mountain, it does look overwhelming. Yeah. But don't look at the mountain. Just look at just look at the next you know base camp. Yeah. And that's enough. Just one step at a time. That's all. It, that's all it is. And a lot of yeah, it is. Yeah, a lot of patience. That's right. And you know, a lot of love for it. You gotta love it. If you don't really love it, that's okay. I mean, I have so many friends over the years who've given up this industry to to discover the thing that they do love. Mm. And that's brilliant. One is not nobler than the other. They just find what you love. And for some people, it was too much pain. It wasn't, it wasn't worth the pain. And that's okay. And now they've found totally love and, and, and contentment in a completely different job. And most actors would kill for that kind of content. Mm. You know, we are in a bit of a hamster wheel. So, yeah, man, it's um, uh, that, uh, yeah, having a support group helps uh, quite a bit. You yeah. mentioned you mentioned that you love stories, you love writing, you love telling stories. Why... Why have you noticed over the years that stories for you are so meaningful? What What is it about them specifically that makes you love them well, so much? Yeah, so it took me a while to understand this for sure, you know, because like I said, originally it was just I'll be in the movies and be a star. And then over the years I realised what I was really, what I really care about is this storytelling thing. And when you think about it, stories are one of, I mean, Humans have been telling stories since we could draw on cave walls, right? So since the beginning, we tell stories. We can't not, right? At the end of the day, when we close our eyes and go to sleep, our brain still tells stories in forms of dreams. We can't stop telling stories. We're always telling ourselves stories or telling other people stories. Why are they so important? Because they they are the very thing that um, unites humanity, Right. So we may speak different languages. We, we, for some reason, Mr. Bean is popular in every country around the world, right? Why? He doesn't speak a language. Mr. Bean is silent. He's this mute character. But people, people, we, we can all find Mr. Bean funny in a way. You know what I mean? Like there's something amazing about that to me. And I think, I think stories are a, are, are a great way of taking strangers and giving them a shared experience. Mm. So my mum always said that a, a, a sorrow shared is a sorrow halved. A joy shared is a joy doubled. And I think that's what stories do, right? They halve your sorrow and double your joy. And, um, if, if uh, you know, we may not cure cancer as storytellers, but actually I, I think without stories, um, humanity would be pretty unbearable. Mm. You know, it's why through the, through the most painful experiences, um, you know, people have come out with, you know, some of the best literature or music or poetry, because that's sometimes the only way humans can process agony and pain and suffering is through art. Mm. Um, and, and so there is something, you know, even if, if you ask like the average guy in the street or in a pub, you know, do you love stories? They ask stories, man. No, 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 no. I don't need stories. I'm like, oh, you sort of do it because I dare you to go through two weeks without listening to music, listening to the news, or what reading the news, or watching a TV show that you love. Tell me what life is like at the end of that two weeks. I imagine pretty shitty, yeah, and pretty lonely. Yeah, you don't get to listen to. You. No friend can tell you what they did on the weekend. That's a story. You don't get to, no, you can't tell another friend. What you do? No, no stories. You don't let any stories for two weeks. I, I don't know, man. That's it. I don't know if you could even do it. I'd die. Yeah, I think we all would. Yeah. And, and so I, I guess what I've, I've come to take real pride in the fact that I, I play a very small role in this storytelling community. Um, and every time I have an experience that I go, I, I want to share that with someone, I try to think of a, a story to be able to get that message across. Mm. Um, 
because, you know, no one wants to know my specific story in a sense, like they don't need to know about my girlfriend or my mom or my dog or whatever. But if I come up with a, a, a bigger story, an allegory, you know, then everyone can relate to that, you know, uh, and, and find something in themselves in it, you know. So, yeah, storytelling, man, it's, it's way more vital and crucial at, to the human experience than I think a lot of people realize. Now, this is the story box. And the reason mm -hmm. why I love having these kinds of conversations is because of your story, Josh, because of all the people that are being able to unbox, I guess, their particular mm -hmm. story. It's, it's inspiring. It's challenging. It's motivating. It's an encouragement and I get to learn. So it's kind of selfish in a way, but that's the power mm -hmm. of a person's story. And I'm curious for you, man, you've, you've told many stories um, through characters and, and even directing and writing and all that sort of stuff. Is there a particular story that you want to share, but you haven't been able to yet? Oh man, so many, so many stories. I've got, I, you know, one of the great things that I have a bit of a, a morbid fascination. I'm not, I'm not scared of death. I, I'm just scared of not being able to be alive. Mm. If that makes sense. You know, the dying part doesn't scare me in a sense, because I know that the only inevitable part of life is death. But what I just I just have so much life I want to live. So one of the things um, I have this folder on my computer. I'm at I'm at my laptop right now, but on my desktop is this folder of ideas. It's called ideas, and I have more ideas in that thing than I will ever be able to make in a lifetime. I just don't have the time, right? And that is one of the saddest things for me. I keep adding to that folder over and over every day. I'm adding to it. I'm adding to it. And it gets longer and longer. And I, I want to tell all of them. I wish I could tell all those stories because they're all interesting to me. And they'll all do different things and they'll touch different people, people I'll never realise, I hope. Um, but, yeah, I, I have so, so many. And next week I'm going away just to have a bit of quiet time, me and my dog, and um, and and to figure out what the next story is going to be, the next one I really wanted to put my time and energy into, what's important. And you know what the older I get, the other thing is, I, I know this this really is surprising to me and, and it's not, I'm not trying to, uh, pander to anyone by saying this, but the older I get, the more I want to leave a po positive messages out into the world in a way. And that doesn't mean every story has to be rosy, but at the, at the heart of it, I think I want to just be a little more mindful of leaving a positive trail in, in my way, just to be able to go, hey, I did my best to add some, you know, either make people think um, more positive thoughts or, or, you know, or to shine a light on, on a sort of, on a sort of thing we should be steering away from or something. I do get a little more mindful of that in my storytelling and that's just maturity. And, and I think, it, you know, life experience, the more I, I live, the, the more important that is. Mm. So those are, those are elements now I, I try to take into my storytelling and it comes to even back to Mortal Kombat, right? Like looking at those fan reactions to the trailer, I mean, that, that gave me so much joy. I can't even begin to tell you. I was like, look, regardless of what happens from this point on, we had that moment in history, that moment where those fans got to watch that trailer and you can't deny the joy, the, the excitement, the thrill. That's, that's awesome. You know, if, if, if you don't get anything else out of this, take that because that is a special thing. And... Um, that made that made it worthwhile. So you can even, you know, you might think that um, an action film doesn't have the opportunity to leave that positive message, but it clearly does. Just look at the joy. It's mm. that's a cool thing, especially with the technology that we have today. Taking the old Mortal Kombat and making it with today's technology is honestly insane. Yeah. I mean, man, absolutely. Like diving into Mortal Kombat right now. I remember when I saw the trailer, I got goosebumps. Like I was yeah. like, dude, that looks insanely good. I wanna, I wanna watch this now. <laughs> um, and I know. I guess, okay, let's let's dive into it. How did you get the role of Kano? I mean, your guess is as good as mine, man. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, not the obvious choice, I, I admit. But um, I I auditioned. You know, simple as that. I was in Los Angeles at the time. This would have been. Um, this would have been 2019, 
early 2019 and um, did, did an audition for the casting agent. That was it. It was just me and the casting agent in the room, nobody else left, and I had this little ritual when I leave an audition. I take the sides, the you know, the sides of the, the scene. You basically hold them in your hand and go in and the lines are on there. And, and any time I leave an audition, I rip it into as many pieces as possible. I throw it in the bin. Just so it's kind of a way of me saying, forget about it. Forget about that audition. You've done what you can. Don't hang on to it. Don't think about it. Don't keep calling your agent going, have you heard anything? Have you heard anything? Am I in the mix? You know, I just rip it up. I throw it away. And I forget about it. Anyway, months and months and months have gone by at this point. And now I'm in pre-production of my own film, writing and directing long story show. I'm in pre-production. I happen to be in Waverly Cemetery, uh, which is a beautiful cemetery in Sydney that overlooks the water. It's gorgeous, but such a bizarre setting for the phone call that I got, which was, hey, you remember that Mortal Kombat audition? And I think I said, vaguely. And they went, yeah, well, you got it. And I went, what are they sure they've got the right guy i mean the, i was like they didn't want to talk to me they want to they didn't want to another audition or anything no no one audition that was it and i'm sure by the way they offered a bunch of other people who had scheduling conflicts but fuck it i'll take a job any way i can get it i don't care if i'm the 10th 100th choice i don't care um but uh, that was it. And then I said, look, I'm, there are going to be some scheduling issues. And they said, let us take care of the scheduling. You need to start getting in shape. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <holy> shit. <laughs> holy shit. i got to start working out. And, uh, and so it, it all sort of came from there. I was, I was shooting, long story short, and, it, you know, and I would be getting up at like 3.30 in the morning and going training and eating, you know, protein gruel. And it was pretty hard. It was a, it was a tough couple of months. But, um, you know, because I because I just had years of not working, I was like, there's no way I'm letting this job slip through my fingers. Mm-hmm. I have got to work. Even if it's working two jobs at the one time, I don't care. Uh, I'd rather I'll sleep when all this is over. And um, I was grateful. I was really grateful for the work, honestly. It was awesome. Congratulations for getting, getting the role. Uh, <laughs> I, I personally, like this is just me, but I personally can't imagine a better person to fit the role of Kano. Because if wow, you look, well, that's really nice. If you look at the cartoon and you look at the trailer, like, mm. damn, <laughs> it's oh. it's so similar. I didn't I didn't realize it, but I guess it was the role I was born to play. I, I loved playing him. I loved it. It was so much fun. And and uh, yeah, the more the more the deeper I got into it, the more fun I had with him. You know, he really was kind of a character. You could just take the you know no filter take the leash off and he was just like a junkyard dog he was great yeah what was your creative process like with actually forming the character of Kano? i mean you had the old film to go off that yeah. that, that character being portrayed was it difficult for you to actually get into that kind of character yeah i mean still, you know particularly because you feel the weight of the fandom mm. on top of this thing right so you you know, it's not like just going, oh, here's a character in Kano we've just made up. And you go, okay, well, we could be anything. It's like, well, actually, you can't be anything with this, right? Because you, you, you've got to fit within a certain parameter here because the fans are expecting a, th- a certain thing. And so there's all that backstory of the fan and there's all that mythology, you know, the, the, uh, the evolution over the last few decades that of all the characters, including Kano. Mm. But I didn't re-watch the original film because I didn't, I remembered it, you know, as a kid, but I didn't want to. I didn't want it to be fresh in my mind because I just didn't think it was going to help. Mm. Um, I was either going to look at it and go, "Oh, yeah, I'll do it like that," which is sort of silly, or go, "Oh, don't do it anything like that," which is silly in a different way because now I'm now I'm anti acting. <laughs> you know, if that's a thing. I'm sort of acting against, away from something, which is silly. So I just said, "Look, give me the script." Let's, you know, me and Simon, the director and the writer, we sat down. We were like, "Let's let's talk about." The story. Mm. What story are you trying to tell? We'll get to the mythology second, but let's just go, what are you trying to, how does Kano help tell this story? What does he represent in this film? You know, blah, blah, blah. Great. We got through it. And then we go, now, give me the give me the backstory. Let's look at the lore of this, the mythology. And then you start adding all those elements on top. And you go, okay, great. Mercenary, Black Dragon, relationship with Sonya. Okay, cool. You start adding all these elements to it. And then by the end of it, it's actually kind of easy because 
you know, unlike most characters you get who, you know, that have just exist in that, you know, script for the first time, mm. you've got this massive backstory and, and that helps. That really, really helps. And uh, furthermore, the makeup helps. So you get this, the tat, you know, the full tattoos and the makeup and, and the, you know, the laser eye and the God knows what else, the dirt, the blood, the muck mm. and in the costume and you stand in front of the mirror and, and you're like, fuck. I'm Kane. <laughs> you know, I'm like, holy shit. Unreal. Like, it does sort of look like you're looking at someone else. Mm. And it helps. It just, all that shit helps. And um, so then, and then, after, you know, we did a little bit of rehearsal and we were kicking tires and Simon to go, all right, a little less of that, a little more of that. And with a bit of push, pull, push, pull, you're finally honing in on the sweet spot. And even after a couple of days of shooting, to be honest, you start going, oh, I don't think that worked. Uh, and you look at a few rushes, you know, dailies or whatever back, and you go, oh, I could do a little less of that, a little more of that. And then by the end of the first week, I think I was I was in the zone, for better or worse. I was in my, my version of K-9. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it was pretty, yeah, I could, it was like slipping in, in, into an old suit. Mm-hmm. We'd just step on a set and the way he walked, the way he talked, it was, it was fucking fun. Yeah, it was really cool. For the fans out there that absolutely love Kano, how can you say how much you're actually in the film? This is going to be released <laughs> like after the film's actually released, but I want to get the, the inside. <laughs> well, um, let me just say for all those people who don't love Kano, <laughs> you, might, you might be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working the other way around. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that is so yeah. cool. So the film gets released April 16th. Uh, on yeah. HBO Max, I believe, uh, streaming. Yeah. Is it, does it? But we get it out. I think in Oz, we it, it comes out in, in theaters here. In, in Oz, I hope so. I, really I think so. Know. Yeah. So okay, so it's getting a theatrical release here in Australia for those. I think so. Australian yeah. Fans, and then it's also getting a streaming one as well. So go and see it when it comes out, April sixteenth. This will be going out directly when it it's <laughs> so yeah uh, hope you guys really enjoy it uh josh yeah. i have two more quick final questions for you if you don't mind because we've got four don't minutes mind. left on the zoom but yeah this is my all-time favorite question so it's a hypothetical one imagine yep. with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100 all your yep. friends have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done don't ask me how in the world they got it all we'll call it magic for the sake of an argument but they've been able yeah. to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Oof. I, I hope um, I hope it's a comedy. <laughs> uh, I do. I hope it's funny. Um, and uh, I, hope, I hope it has a happy ending. <laughs> I really don't want it to end sad. Um, yeah, I hope, uh, and and I hope that all the starring characters are still there to uh, to watch it with me. Mm. Which character are you most proud of that you portrayed on screen? Um, let's go. Aww. Moose. I um I assume he's gonna be played by The Rock. <laughs> I just feel he's got that, you know, he's got that heroic element to it. Yeah, no, that little he's on my bed sleeping right now. <laughs> I right now my dog sort of feels like the most important person in my life. And so maybe shit, maybe this movie's a tragedy. I just realized the more I talk about it, the more I realize I think it's hard. So oh, here we go. Who's that's, this? That's my German Shepherd puppy. Her name's her name's no. Lisa Joy. She's on the couch sleeping. So Moose, there you go. You, get, you, you feel me. I understand you. So, <laughs> Josh. Uh, so yeah, so my, my film would be called Must Love Dogs if it if that film title wasn't already taken. Yeah. Uh, I definitely watch it just for the fa- for the sake of watching a dog. <laughs> exactly. That's it, man. Don't watch it for me. Watch no. it for Moose. No. And and yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you have to get through some of my life first. <laughs> I love it. Josh, man, it's been an absolute pleasure unboxing a little bit of your story. I wish you had more time. Definitely going to do a part two later on. But thank you so much for coming on the Storybox podcast, man. Anytime, man. Love it. I appreciate you talking to me.